if you were given a chance to talk to the leader of both countries, both countries means China as well as United States, what would you suggest to each one of them? Well, where are the products? All right. Where are the products that um, are consumed in the U.S. and uh, in Europe? Where are they made? They're made in, in Asia and all these countries that they're blaming for not meeting their goals. They're made by, um, you know, and owned by uh, companies, uh, European, American, et cetera, uh, who are, you know, <laughs> they're profiting from this. And yet piously, they start talking about, well, why don't you measure up to our goals? All right. This is, it's the hypocrisy of it. People have no shame whatsoever in accusing others of doing exactly what they're doing themselves. We, we need to come back to reality to start thinking, if you want a sustainable world, you have to have one in which you have uh, the ability to sit down and talk to people in a realistic way, not respond to populist sentiment of the moment or you know, fanning it uh, because it'll get you an election or something like that. We need statesmen. We don't need uh, populists at this juncture. We're at a crisis. Uh, we need to get um, you know, very serious about it. Speaking of uh, hypocritical, you think the world has always like that or operates like that? Well, hypocrisy is always, it's, it's always there, um, but you know, at, at, different, at different junctures, I mean, it uh, becomes more of a problem when you start having people failing to see how hypocritical they are. And this is where I sense the danger is and hypocrisy is there. Um, it's when people start believing that they're right, even though they're being hypocritical. That is the danger zone. Because once you start believing that you're right and everybody's wrong, all right, you will take actions based on that. And those actions have devastating consequences. You saw this in World War. I mean, every war starts with these kind of premises that I'm right, everybody's wrong. What I do is always justified, no matter if it even violates uh, the principles that I'm trying to impose on others. Once you get to that point, yeah, we are in grave, grave danger. Well, speaking of hypocritical, where do you see the U.S.-China relations? Well, I mean, I'm the 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 key here is, as I was talking about earlier, that you have two different systems, and they have to understand each other um, better. Uh, and, and and this is not just a, a fault of the U.S. China is in, amazingly blind um, to the countries around it. I mean, there's this Belt and Road, there's RCEP. Um, you know, there's all these trade agreements and things like that. But when you get down to it, words are not enough. I mean, translation, if somebody translates something, I always used to take two translators with me, one to do the you know, translation, the other one to take notes. Let us say that there was quite a difference between what was said and what was actually meant uh, during these uh, discussions. And this was just, you know, a bit of business type things and things like this. So. Um, you can imagine how, you know, even compounded that comes when you're dealing with different cultures. Uh, there are so many assumptions. You, you cannot deal with America uh, unless you have read the literature, the, uh, the Bible, um, the philosophy going back to uh, uh, Greek times. Um, you have to have a kind of holistic understanding. And you, the same is true about China. You're not going to understand it until you start studying um, the Chinese history, philosophy, uh, read their, you know, their five um, um, big books. You, you don't even begin to have some sort of idea of how different uh, a culture you're dealing with. So on one hand, there can be very little progress um, between these two nations until they accept that they're different, but differences are okay. Um, and you know, for the U.S., the big problem here is the idea that it's the job, American exceptionalism, uh, you know, justifies us in doing anything necessary to bring China into, quote, the fold, uh, even if the, you know, the fold that they're talking about isn't working. I mean, it's 
the hypocrisy is that um, Biden shows up um, in Europe and he starts talking about the values and how they, you know, the rest of the world should, ex- you know, accept U.S. leadership um, and go forward and all this stuff. But you know, back at home, he can't get his domestic agenda through. We have increased polarization. He's, you know, he's 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 slipping behind. And you know, people in Europe and the rest of the world are wondering. You know, what's going to happen in, in uh, three years? Um, you know, is there going to be a change in government? Is there going to be a seesaw between somebody who has views, uh, either Donald Trump himself or somebody like Donald Trump who says, well, I don't even believe in climate change, so I'm going to take this off the table. I don't believe in uh, uh, the UN. I don't even believe in these meetings. Um, you know, there's, there's this reliability issue. Uh, within the U.S., the only way we can address that is internally. We, we have to come back together as a country. We have to start establishing what, what brings us together instead of what pulls us apart. The U.S. Uh, was founded on the idea that there would be no one religion. Why? Because you had, uh, you know, the U.S. was a dumping ground for everybody who was unhappy uh, with the situation that they had at home vis-a-vis of religion or economics. So there was the idea that within your house, you pursue and you teach your children the way you, you feel, and the government should not get involved in that. Uh, but outside your house, you, you do not take your views and try to impose them on others. And this is a formula that worked very well for the United States, often at great cost. You know, we, we always make it sound like it was a wonderful experience. It wasn't. Half, half the pilgrims who came and landed at Plymouth Rock were dead uh, within the first year. Um, these people who went out into the, the forest, many of them did not prosper. Um, many died, uh, were you know, in horrible situations. It wasn't fun. It wasn't an adventure. It was just survival. And that's the way it was. But we, we were able to, to develop that and build a, uh, you know, a sense of a culture, a pioneer culture. Um, and that kind of united us. Now, uh, it's it's really hard to figure out what our commonalities are, and um, that's different. So until we come together as a nation, uh, it's hard for other countries to take us seriously. And on China's side, as I said, they have blind spots, and they have to uh, develop a, a sensitivity to that and understand that well, while it's not something they believe, it's not going to be something that people are going to abandon uh, when they're dealing with other areas. And understanding the countries around them, uh, the politics, the culture, the literature, philosophy, um, this is extremely important. And I've been involved in a number of efforts um, to try to get uh, on both sides, try to get people to say, look, you know, don't don't assume there's only two cultures, U.S. and China. All right. There are a lot of other voices out there. And you, it's time we start understanding each other and stop trying to you know, bludgeon each other into what we think, uh, you know, is uh, the perfect uh, world. Uh, there is no perfect world. It's an ongoing journey, and you are doing your best to work with the dynamics that you find yourself in. You have grandkids? You have kids? I have two children, yes. No grandchildren as of yet. No grandchildren. My question is, what kind of world would you like grandkids to grow up in? If you have a dream... My my dream is that um, we have a multipolar world in which you um, c- uh, countries will go to an uh, entity like the UN uh, and uh, not have to deal with the kind of bureaucratic nonsense that goes on, uh, uh, but instead uh, can uh, actually uh, work out their economic, uh, political, and uh, belief differences in a way uh, that respects each country. I mean, these are sovereign countries. I don't care how small or how large you are. You're still a sovereign country. Uh, you deserve a certain amount of respect, and you are in charge of the people uh, there. Um, I'm hoping that we can avoid civil strife, that we can avoid uh, climate disasters, that climate change um, is, you know, putting us on, you know, on a course towards. Um, I, you know, the civil strife of Know, neglect, active neglect uh, by countries. I hope that has changed. And one of the issues, and this isn't going to be very popular, is uh, I noticed that there was no serious discussion of population. Uh, China was able to solve a lot of its problems through great hardship and sacrifice. 
And uh, now they're they're changing that. I, I question that, and I have uh, on a number of occasions. I don't know that you need more people, um, especially given that productivity is rising due to machines and man, not man hours alone. And that you know uh, consumption is not related to numbers; it's related to disposable income. Uh, plus, you know, China has 32% of its uh, people who are in the agricultural area. And the truth is, uh, U.S. has 2%. And we, have, we grow more food uh, than, you know, we can consume ourselves. So <clears throat> I think some of the assumptions that we make about the need for population um, expansion are wrong. We've doubled the world's population in the last 50 years. And um, you know, no one seems to want to talk about the fact that what's pushing energy uh, and consumption, uh, the impact on the world, the amount of plastics in the ocean, all of these things is a product of population. I'm not saying that you ever in the world identify, you know, says, look, we're going to go to a one child policy. But at some point, you have to deal with the elephant in the room. And that is there has to be some sort of responsible approach. Uh, to reproduction, or we will literally, I don't care what we do, uh, or you know, finance and things like that, the population pressures will be overwhelming. Uh, it's not something that's controlled naturally. You know, you look at a place like Afghanistan. Most people think that Afghanistan was decimated during the period that we invaded. But since 2001, um, the Afghan population has increased by 80%. So uh, this this uh, notion that somehow you know everyone's been wiped out uh, as a defense uh, mechanism. You study wars during the wars, the number of ch uh, children produced by women actually goes up. So when women start having four or five, six children apiece, all right, you're going to see rapid infection. The median age of Afghan is 18 years. 18 years old. So you have this huge glut of young people. There's no jobs. There's uh, no, no right now. There's no no even basic necessities, food, water, uh, you know, energy, things like this. And yet they're going to be coming into a system where there's no hope. And you know, to to me, to my mind, if you study any kind of model, look at realistically, uh, putting huge amounts of young people with no hope together uh, is equal to catastrophe. It's uh, ripe for um, you know, recruitment to terrorism, uh, crime, you name it. If you're not attached to society, you will do whatever you think you have to to survive. Let's change the subject. Let's talk about the issue of Taiwan. Do you think there's war going to break out? If there's a flashpoint that could lead to a major confrontation, it would be Taiwan. But I, I think, I, I don't know if you recall uh, General Milley, when he made his phone calls uh, to the, his Chinese counterpart, he mentioned specifically that the Chinese thought the U.S. was trying to goad uh, them into a war over Taiwan. And that he was sending a signal that, look, you know, we're not trying to do that and all this type of things. But um, let's look at it from a geopolitical. I, I can be quite cynical when it comes to politics. Uh, the fact is, um, for the U.S., for us, it would be, uh, in, in terms of the current politicians there, it would be a tremendous justification if, in fact, uh, mainland um, took over Taiwan uh, physically. Uh, why? Because at that point, okay, so Taiwan is gone. And, there, and there, no one pretends that there's really any way in which the Taiwanese could resist uh, a major onslaught uh, by the mainland. Um, you, you go back over the, uh, the, the strategic papers, even the most recent one said, that's nah, nothing we can do. Okay. But that would be a huge PR win for the United States. And it's, and it, and those who think along the same political lines as the United States, because they say, look, China is the evil aggressive empire. We always told you it was, 